Hey guys, I'm Adam from Top Dog. Thanks for joining us for another live Q&A, something that we think we are going to be doing every other week from now on. This is our third one. This is my beautiful wife, Andrea. For those of you that don't know her, she's going to be helping me out. So we're going to take just a second to get everything queued up on the computers real quick. Make sure you've got that on mute. And let's see. You should get a notification here. Okay, be sure to comment and say hi and maybe where you're from so that we can see how many people are actively on this video. Yeah, let us know. And of course, you can ask questions. We've got some questions prepared ahead of time that people have sent in for us. But this is a live Q&A. You get to ask questions live right now um, so you can join us and, and interact with us. We're happy to answer questions. I think we have time for at least two or three more on top of the ones that have been asked so far. So. Um, it looks like we are all queued up on my end. Are you all queued up on your end? Mm -hmm. oh, I thought I had you. Hi, Stephen. There you go. And you should be able to see everything right there. All right, guys. Also, something that you can do, hit that share button so that way you can let your friends know that this is going on. I'm sure a lot of you guys have friends that might have some questions about dogs as well. And so hit that share button. If you do that right now, they can join in. And, and again, this is all about us interacting with you guys and uh, being able to have a, a nice live conversation with you or as close as we can to that. Uh, so anyway, I like to just jump right in. We don't have a whole lot of time set aside for this, and so I want to make sure we can answer as many of your questions as possible. So Andrea, what's our first one? Um, Karen on Facebook asked, how do we correct our dog when on a walk in the neighborhood and squirrels or other animals distract her? She wants to chase them, and it's hard to control the jumping so we can continue on the walk. All right, Karen, now since I know you personally, I can give you some really exact advice on how to help Belle with this. And it's actually going to be similar to some of the things that we did back when Belle was struggling with jumping on people when they walked in the house. Now, I know that Belle already has a foundation of being able to walk appropriately. So we're going to skip how to introduce her to walk appropriately. She's already got that foundation. I know in general she can do it but that she struggles when there's bigger distractions from the sounds of it. So first of all, make sure that you okay. keep in mind when it's time to correct her, that sometimes you have to adjust your corrections to meet the needs of the distraction, right? Like if you get in a car accident or something like that, I'm gonna have to like get right in your face to tell you like, hey, look at me, listen. Like you gotta get right in your face. You gotta turn up the volume a little bit. Same thing that you have to do when you're training your dog. Sometimes you have to turn up the volume of that correction. So if you're using a training collar, for example, a star marker or an e-collar, you know, you have to turn up the e-collar some or with a star marker or a prong collar, you have to correct a little bit harder in order to get your point across so that the dog will listen and respond appropriately. Another thing that I really encourage you to do is to make sure that you get that dog to shut it down and come down to a calmer state before you keep moving on. A lot of people will get the dog, it'll see that rabbit and it'll run off and then a lot of people just like turn around and try to just get the dog away from it. What happens when you do that is it's kind of like compressing all that energy that the dog just had that got all built up. They see that squirrel and they want to take off for it and then you just like pull them back without really correcting them and getting them to come back down to a calmer state of mind. That's the exact same way that we train police canines to explode on bad guys. We get them all amped up about getting that bad guy and then we say, nope, you can't have it. And we pull them back. It's like compressing a spring and it makes them want the bad guy that much worse. So you might actually be doing that if you're not bringing her down to a calmer state of mind before moving forward on your walk. So make sure that you correct her, get her down to a calm state of mind before progressing. Don't just let her just fight through it and then put her away and, uh, and just compress that energy, okay? Hope that helps. All right. Okay, Stephen Moore on our live said, one of my dogs, Ruger, has recently started lying down to eat his meals. Otherwise, he seems fine. Is he just being lazy or should we be concerned? Thanks. All right. So that's an interesting one. I would have to guess, but I'm not 100% positive. I haven't put a ton of thought into that. I will say I have seen some dogs that are guarding their food. They'll lay down and put the paws on either side of the bowl, and that's a way for them to kind of guard their food uh, against either another dog or against you. So if you see any lip raising or growling or anything like that along with it, 
then you need to address and take some some of the protocols that we have in place for how to fix resource guarding. Um, but other than that, uh, I don't see anything super concerning with that unless you see any other signs of resource guarding. Um, just laying down to eat the food might just be being a little bit lazy. And of course, I know Ruger as well, and he had that leg break. And so it might just be that it's easier for him to lay down because of his previous leg injury. Not super sure. So um, let me know how that one progresses, but I can't think of any reason why I'd be super concerned about it, um, other than unless I saw some other signs of resource guarding. Destiny on Facebook asked, how do you get your dog to listen when called? All right, so I'm actually gonna answer that one and, and uh, with, or answer that question with a little bit of a question and ask how often or what are the times that you call your dog? Because a lot of people, when they stop and think about when they're actually calling their dog, the only times that they actually call their dog are when it's kind of a crappy situation for the dog. The most frequent times that people call their dog is when the dog is out in the backyard playing and it's time for the dog to come inside because playtime is over. So think about that for just a minute from your dog's perspective. Every time you call them, something not very fun happens. They either get put in the crate or you have to leave to go to work or they have to quit playing in the backyard or whatever. So it's always a drag for the dog. Very few people come to me from the start and they've been practicing making it fun for the dog to come to them. So that's my first thing, is practice it at times other than when you need it. Practice and make it fun and exciting and rewarding for your dog to come to you. Start with simple, basic exercise. I start on a six foot leash, the dog's six feet away from me, I call them to me, they come to me, I praise them, I reward them, I'll give them a treat, their favorite toy, things like that. And so I make that really fun and exciting for the dog. Now. Coming when called is something that, of course, takes multiple layers, right? Getting your dog to come to you around the house versus when you're out at the park and there's a squirrel that takes off in front of you and your dog's 50 feet away off leash is obviously a much deeper level. But I always tell everybody the same thing. You need to start by making sure that you make it fun and rewarding for your dog first. And from there, you can Actually. build up. Also, another important aspect of that is make sure that you are never punishing your dog for coming to you. Now you might say, Adam, that sounds crazy. Why would I ever punish my dog for coming to me? Well, guess what? Pretty much everybody I ask has done this at some point in their life. When your dog does something wrong, jumps up on the counter, gets in the trash, chews on your shoe or your favorite piece of furniture or something, you call them over and you say, bad dog, you were chewing on my shoes, right? Well, guess what? You just punished your dog for coming to you. Dogs have a very short correlation period. They've done multiple studies on this and they found that most of the time, when a dog does something, if that event has transpired two seconds ago or longer, they're no longer associating the current uh, punishment or reward with whatever happened longer than two seconds ago. So when you call your dog to you, they're thinking, okay, that action of chewing on the shoes is now over. I now come to you, so now that's the last thing I did. That is what I, the consequences have to do with, either punishment or reward, they're thinking, if I come to you and I get in trouble, okay, every time you call me, it's that black and white for the dog. If I call you and you get in trouble, then you learn, all right, I shouldn't come when Adam calls me anymore. So really, it is that simple for the dog. So again, calling your dog starts with a good foundation, and that's the foundation I recommend to everybody. Putting in the work to make it really fun and exciting for the dog, for starters. Don't just call your dog when there's nothing in it for them and it's a drag and playtime is over. And also make sure that you're never correcting your dog when you call them to you. So, great question, Justine. <clears throat> William Miller, an old friend, uh, he asked uh, on our live, hey, my mom has a small dog and has really bad anxiety, so bad that he actually stopped his heart and they got him to come back. It's really bad when people leave the house, what should they do? Wow, that is a bad one. Okay, so I've never actually had a dog that their anxiety was so bad that their heart stopped but I would probably treat it the same way that I treat all the dogs um, that have really bad separation anxiety. So what you're describing, Will, is you know people leave the house and the dog's anxiety gets super, super bad. Um, <clears throat> frequently, separation anxiety comes from a number of things, and, it's, and, and again, this is something that goes really multiple layers. But one of the first things I like to eliminate when dogs have separation anxiety is I like to eliminate overexcited, overadrenalized entries and exits from the house. 
So when I've got a little dog, I'm not sure what uh, Will's parents' dog's name is, but we're going to say Rover. So when I've got Rover that gets really anxious, what I like to do is make sure that when I leave, I do the opposite of what those folks are probably doing, which is they get all huggy, lovey, dovey, kissy. They get the dog all worked up before they leave the house. I very, very seldomly see a dog that has separation anxiety that the, that the folks are not doing this. So everybody gets all huggy, lovey, dovey. They get the dog all worked up and then they leave. So then the dog just got all this love, affection, attention, baby talk, all that stuff, and now they're all amped up and you just left. And it causes this anxiety to start. And then what happens when you come home, you do the same thing. Oh my goodness, Rover, I missed you so much. And you get the dog all amped up again. So these entries and exits are becoming these big events that are making the dog have some crazy emotional swings. So that's the first thing is eliminate any excitement. I don't even talk to my dogs when I leave the house or when I first come in. Be and, and that might sound harsh or whatever, but guess what? My dogs don't have separation anxiety problems because of that. We need to make sure that we're not creating these huge events for entries and exits when we're, en when we're coming home or leaving home because then the dogs get so worked up and that E that excess energy quickly turns into negative energy, which can turn into anxiety, and these are just all problems. So that's where I would start. Again, separation anxiety that's that bad, that his heart has stopped, probably going to need to schedule a Skype session or something because we need to go even deeper than that. But that's where I'd start with every single dog that has separation anxiety is quit with the uh, high energy, a bunch of adrenaline pumping entries and exits. Yeah, Matt said he would probably have the dog check for a heart issue. Yeah, for your heart to stop from separation anxiety, I mean, that's something that most likely the dog has a heart murmur as well. Mm -hmm. um, just And when they've got super high adrenaline pumping, that, that kind of went hand in hand. I, I really don't think I've ever heard of a dog just having such bad separation anxiety that that would just cause the heart to stop. But I can see it when it's layered with a heart murmur, I could definitely see that happening. And again, this is really important. You know, obviously if the dog's heart is stopping, this is something that they need to take really seriously. And it's selfish of us to do all the lovey-dovey stuff with the dog when we leave or when we come home. And I tell people, don't love on your dog when you leave or come home. They're, oh, but he's going to be so sad. Well, guess what? In this case, it could be life or death. They need to get on this right away. So take it seriously and, and let's get that dog some help. <clears throat> okay, if you just joined and you have some questions, be sure to comment them now. We have just um, about 10 minutes left. Um, Mark on Instagram asked, I just got a new puppy. What kind of puppy food should I feed it? All right, Mark. So that's a tough one. And to be honest, it's extra tough this week. I just got back last week from the International Association of Canine Professionals Yearly Conference. Sorry, that's kind of a mouthful. Um, <clears throat> but while there, uh, I did a session and learned a little bit more about dog nutrition and I'm always trying to study dog nutrition. Unfortunately, there's just so much information out there, so much misinformation out there that uh, my perceptions, my views on nutrition, I'm always adapting, I'm always changing them a little bit. And so my answer for this is probably going to change again shortly because I've just added some new stuff to my research. <clears throat> but the area where I'm going to tell you to start is to go to dogfoodadvisor.com. Dogfoodadvisor.com has awesome, unbiased reviews. Um, they're not sponsored by any dog food companies. A lot of veterinarians are recommending like Science Diet and Royal Canin. And I don't say this to bash veterinarians. I've got a lot of great relationships with veterinarians, so don't get me wrong. But unfortunately, veterinarians are spread so thin. They're surgeons, they're ear, nose, and throat doctors. They're, they have to work on multiple species. A lot of them don't unfortunately have the time to spend a lot of the, a lot of their time studying nutrition and they get companies like Science Diet and Royal Canin that come in and ask them to sell their foods in their stores and unfortunately these foods have pretty big price tags but very low value, okay? So I recommend most folks start on dogfoodadvisor.com and on that website it's got a great mobile site as well you can open that website up while you're at the pet food store and you can be looking and browsing at pet foods uh, browsing different pet foods and you can punch in the name of that pet food on dogfoodadvisor.com and you can get pretty instant feedback the quality of that food so not only do they do a five star rating system so you're gonna have a quick guide you know you're gonna know if it's a four or a five star food or whatever but also they tell you why they gave it that score and you can look through the ingredients and find out really quickly why it got the score that it got. Um, 
So that's where I'm gonna tell most people to start is on dogfoodadvisor.com. Also, I wrote a few more details in a blog about a year and a half ago. Uh, some things have changed since then, but it's still got some helpful information in it. So um, you can check out that blog as well to make sure that uh, you're heading in the right direction. But dogfoodadvisor.com is where I'd start. I don't just make a blanket statement where I would recommend you going uh, for dog food just because wherever you live in the country is gonna depend on what's available to you. Um, I also don't typically recommend puppy foods. The problem I've seen with lots of those is that they help the muscles grow really fast. So you see this puppy growing really fast. You think, oh wow, the puppy food's working great, but the bone and joint development can't keep up. And so you end up with puppies that have really wide open growth plates and other issues. Um, hip dysplasia can be a problem as well there. So well, now we're starting to get some live questions. So we're going to have to cut the answers a little shorter. Okay. So we can get through all of them before yeah. we're done. And don't forget to speak up so everybody can hear you. Okay, so, and I also linked the Dog Food Advisor in the comments. So you'll have that link in there. And also the link to the blog that he wrote on the same subject. Awesome. Let's do the question about service dogs that got phoned in. And okay. then we can do the live questions. Okay. So. so right before our live started, we got a call that um, they wanted it to be mentioned in the live Q&A from Alex. Um, and he asked, what qualities do you look for in a potential service dog? Yeah, so for those of you that don't know, we do a lot of service dog training here at Top Dog as well, primarily diabetic alert dogs, uh, but we do train several others. And Alex asked specifically about like smaller dogs. So I do wanna, uh, first of all, make sure that when you're selecting a smaller dog that you really put in your homework with choosing the right dog for the job. In its simplest form, what I'm looking for when I go to select a service dog I look for a dog that's lower energy, but higher drive. What I mean by the higher drive is that they're, they're, they want to work for stuff, but lower energy in that they can chill when I chill. So I want that dog that if they like balls, they're going to work hard for that ball. I can hide the ball under the couch, or I can hide it behind me or something, and they're going to work to try to figure out how to get that ball. If they like treats, I make it really hard to get a treat. Believe it or not, I've got this really silly clear box. In this clear box, I'll either put a treat right in front of them, or I'll put a ball in that clear box. And I like to see how long the dog will sit there and figure out how to get that treat or that ball out of the box. Because that tells me how much drive they have. If they'll sit there for 10 minutes and try to get a ball out of a box, that tells me that dog's got a lot of drive. But then again, I need to balance that with lower energy. Now with small dogs, we end up running into some extra problems. Because a lot of small dogs have been bred for years and years to not have much of a working personality, not have much of a working drive. Uh, you know, Pomeranian, Shih Tzus, Pugs, a lot of these dogs have been bred as lap dogs and they don't really have any drive. So take that into consideration. Now I will say we did have one Pomeranian that was a successful diabetic alert dog, but that's one of many uh, small dogs that we've tried. Um, but again, that was just a, a dog that just really had what it took. Remember, when you're selecting a service dog, you can't make a square peg fit a round hole, so you've got to be very, very selective about it. So again, look for that lower energy, but higher drive. Another thing you might take into consideration is what's something called the Volhard Aptitude Test. Now, this was specifically designed for puppies. However, I find that it's still pretty successful in older dogs as well. If you don't just have puppies to choose from, it still gives you at least a baseline to learn a little bit more about that dog. And so we'll include that in the comments too the Volhard Aptitude Test, so great place to start. Okay, I'll link that in the comments below, but um, our next question is from Jamie. I'm new to your page and your live Q&A, so hopefully this isn't a question you've already answered. We've just moved and the people who live around us are super loud. Their daughter jumps up and down continuously mm -hmm. and is constantly startling my dog. Calypso to where it triggers her to be reactive barking wise. Any advice on how to condition with spooky sounds? All right, Jamelyn, thanks so much for your question and thanks for joining us for the first time. Uh, so yeah, spooky sounds, uh, things like that um, can be a real problem and, and they can start to lead to major anxiety, not just reactivity. And so something that you definitely wanna to try to nip in the bud as soon as you can. Um, again, we've got a pretty step-by-step -step video on YouTube to help you with that and it's going to go a lot more in depth than what I have time for right now so Andrea will make sure to get that one uh, put in the comments down below by the time we're done here um, but yeah you want to start off by first of all 
one of the things I like to do is start just doing desensitization exercises for the dog. So start off with smaller noises that the dog can handle and then just work your way up to louder and louder noises as the dog gets better and better. A lot of times I like to use YouTube to help me with that. You can get on YouTube and you can find just about any noise that you can think of. You type in on YouTube, one hour track of kids screaming or thunder or lightning or whatever and you're, you'll be amazed at how much you can find there on YouTube uh, just different noises and things like that that are going to help you and you start off playing those things soft in the background a lot of times I like to put them on really soft while the dog's eating so they start associating noises with good things and then you gradually turn that up little by little believe it or not I first learned that trick from a uh, well not using YouTube because it was before YouTube but about 15 years ago I met a bird dog hunter who when he got dogs that were gun shy, that's exactly what he would do. He would Every time he put the, their food down, he would play a track that had gunshots going off in the background. And every day he turned that up just a couple more points and a couple more points. And he got to the point that that thing could just be blasting in the background while they're eating. And then he started off with a low caliber rifle in real life, a 22, and gradually worked his way up to louder and louder noises. So you do the same thing with your dog to start desensitizing to those noises. And again, that's if it's something that's coming out of fear. If it's just reactivity or territorial issues, we'd probably have to take a whole different direction, which might warrant uh, a phone call or a Skype lesson or something. So. Okay, and I linked that YouTube video where he talks about that in the comments below. And then Lindsay said or asked, <coughs> um, my dog used to be totally chill in thunderstorms until one time nine or ten years ago. I made the dumb decision to take her to fireworks. Now, anytime there's a storm, she's super anxious and jumps up on our bed, which we don't let her do normally, and whines and cries during the storm. Any suggestions? Yeah, so she's been doing this for nine or ten years now, so it's definitely going to be hard. I don't believe in the old saying that you can't teach a dog new tricks, but when they've been doing it for nine or ten years, there are definitely it's going to be pretty embedded in her, so you're going to have to really hit this one hard. Um, but believe it or not, actually the same video that I just mentioned to Jamie Lynn, I think, um, it covers how to fix the problems with thunderstorms as well. So find that video that Andrea just linked, uh, and it goes very in depth on how to work on thunderstorms too. I, I just wanted to add to that. Um, oftentimes we don't realize that we're adding, um, or we're encouraging the dog to, um, be, be fearful or be scared. And the way we're doing that on without realizing it is by kind of babying or coddling the dog. So when when your dog is very fearful in, in those moments, let's say there's fireworks or there's thunder in the background outside, um, don't say, it's okay, it's okay, and you know, be petting and rubbing your dog because in in their mind you're saying, Good job, good job. Be scared. That's good. You're you're whining, you're crying, I like that. Keep doing that. So just um, G be self-aware of how you're talking, how you're, what energy you're putting <clears throat> off to your dog. You don't want to give the dog um, the, wrong, the wrong signal. Absolutely, yeah, that's huge. You know, we calm and we coddle our kids when they get upset about something and they get scared. But unfortunately with dogs, they don't communicate the same way. It's kind of counterintuitive, but believe it or not with dogs, you know, we need to do like some redirecting and, and desensitizing like that video talks about. Um, so again, uh, get on YouTube, find tracks of thunderstorms. Um, another thing that we find sometimes, uh, I know some trainers think that thunder shirts are a total quack, but I'll tell you what, they work on about 60% or 70% of the dogs that we try them on. So a thunder shirt is something. You might uh, check those out. I think they have them over on Amazon. Um, and they work pretty well in conjunction with desensitizing and stuff. I think where the thunder shirts actually help out a lot too is that sometimes with that thunder and lightning, you can imagine when we've got a lightning storm, how like it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up or something. Well, imagine if you were as hairy as a dog. Some dogs are reacting to all that static electricity that's in the air, and that makes a thunderstorm extra uncomfortable for them. I think the thunder shirts actually help with that a little bit. So again, something that you might keep in mind, and, and also check out that video. It goes way more in depth than what I have time to do here. It goes step by step. It's a free video that we have on YouTube. And Andrea's already linked it in the comments down below. So, Okay, so... I think this is going to have to be our last question, guys. No, that was it. Um, you know, Lindsay just said, I think we did that a long time ago. Now we just kind of nudge her away and try to get her in her bed. But she keeps coming back and waking us up. 
Yeah, so that's just gonna be where you gotta go ahead and take the steps to do the desensitization protocols that that video outlines for you. So, okay, good deal. Good. All right, good deal. Well, we went just a little bit over time, but uh, hopefully nobody minds. We really appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, this has been another great session, so thank you guys all so much. You can send in your questions anytime. We jot them down ahead of time, and uh, if we get enough of them, we might have to start planning for a little bit longer time for these because uh, you guys have just some awesome questions for us. We really appreciate you joining. We especially appreciate you sharing this so that way your friends can see it as well. Uh, we want to be able to help out as many people as possible with these, and so be sure to, to share. When we post this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. And uh, again, we just want to help you guys out. So I'm Adam from Top Dog. There goes Andrea. Thanks for watching.